Welcome to the latest edition of Manpower Group's Human Age event series, where we discuss the latest trends impacting the future for work and for workers with world-leading thinkers in HR, skills, and today, leaders in the future and trends. I'm Becky Frankowitz, president of Manpower Group North America, and I'm so pleased to be joined by two guests today who I promise you, you will find are well-suited to today's topic what HR leaders can learn from consumer trends so we can radically reinvent the way work people work for the benefit of employees and for employers. Faith Popcorn joins us from New York. Faith is a leading futurist. Now that's a cool title, a futurist, <laughs> founder and CEO of Faith Popcorn's Brain Reserve and has been called the trend oracle by the New York Times. She applies her insight in culture and business trends to help Brain Reserve clients reposition established brands and companies, develop new strategies and innovate new products, services, and experiences. I have been a Faith follower for over a decade when Faith and I did our first project together. So Faith, thank you for being here. And we're joined by Michael Swallow from Philadelphia. Michael is Vice President of Competitive Strategy at Comcast Xfinity, where he's responsible for delivering innovative new products and identifying needs for future products and solutions. So what do both of these two have in common? A bias for the future applied to today. Faith and Michael's working relationship began when Brain Reserve created a future view of meeting the demands of connected living with Xfinity Comcast. Through this project, a business crush was born. I love that term, <laughs> business crush. They recently co-presented at the Broadband World Forum discussing future predictions for emerging consumer patterns. Again, future and emerging is going to be our focus today. It is great to see you both. A reminder to our audience, we'll finish the discussion with Q&A. So please enter your questions in the chat function and we'll get to as many as we can later in our conversation. I promise you, you'll be glad you spent our time with us. It's going to be a fun discussion. So our first topic is consumer trends. The last nine months has changed everything, including people. Faith, you're an expert on future trends for consumers. What are three words you'd use to describe how people are feeling right now? I would say um, rebellious, like just about to pop. I would say jolted, um, which is the name of my podcast, Jolty. And then unsure. And then one more thing. We're headed, I think, towards something we're calling dark revelry, like mm -hmm. wanting to party, but maybe like in an underground, like, but in a very, I, I say violent, I mean energetic in that way, way. So um, that's what I'm thinking. Very interesting. So, Michael, I'd love to hear the same from you. You're in one of the fastest moving industries of media and comms. How do you think people are feeling right now? You know, um, I think it's really interesting. I think people are hearkening back to this, their, their school days of it's, it basically comes down to, you know, what, when, and where. It's, it's really like, what is this happening around us? Um, you know, when will it be over? And, and where will we be when it is, quote, over? What is over really going to mean? What is this new normal mm -hmm. going to look like? And I think that's that's questions and thoughts on both consumer sides and you know corporate sides. Yes, I want to talk a little more about that, Michael. So, what will over mean? Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, we're starting to these past nine. <clears throat> excuse me, these past nine months is really as Faith and I talked about, you know, brought the future forward faster. Right, mm. things that he envisioned would be happening. Uh, six, seven, ten years from now are, are now happening today, you know, where our homes have evolved into these workspaces, learn spaces, health spaces, et cetera. And I don't think that when we when we contemplate over, I don't know that any of this will completely go away. This will now become part of our everyday experiences to some extent. There will be bifurcated experiences. And um, yeah, so I think that over is never going to mean that it goes away. And even if we think it does, it'll be back. I mean, I think we've just entered a stage as a, as a world that uh, pandemics are uh, going to become, you know, more and more, not less and less. 
So I love the language around bringing the future forward faster. And so at, at Manpower Group, we've been talking about how um, workers, seeing workers as consumers. In fact, I coined the phrase, the consumerization of talent, because workers are increasingly saying when, where, and how they want to work, just like we're saying when, where, and how we want to consume. Faith, I would love to hear a bit of insight from you on how you're seeing consumer behavior change and how you'd say that's impacting the world of work. Well, you know, first of all, when we call them workers, it makes me feel like we're in communist China. <laughs> You know, I mean, they're just people trying to survive. So the, the question about how, how the world is, well, you know what happened? We let, we let, we talk about prison. We let, we open the doors to the, to the prison. We said to people who are begging, can I work at home one day, please? You know, because I really have to go to the supermarket a little bit in the middle of the blah, blah, blah. And now they're home every day. And you know what? I've heard so many, many of them say, I'm not coming back. I think they found their worker freedom. They 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 are able to work in the pace that they want to work. I mean, I'm a night worker, you know, so I, I start like working really heavy after the sun goes down. And I, I think that I think they enjoy being home, a lot of them, uh, with their family, seeing the family. I mean, some people are going like enough already, but I I, I just think they're enjoying their newfound freedom and um access to the refrigerator. And Faith, have you seen in all the consumer trend work that you do, because that's how you and I met in the, in the consumer business, are you- You have to tell them the prediction I made for you, Becky. Well, let, let's hear it, Faith, go ahead, share. So no, when I met Becky, what were you working on? It was Pepsi. It was it, it was at the Frito-Lay business. I was working on snacks for women. Snacks for women, and we weren't getting very far, worry, we, Becky, no, because no, uh, no. That, that particular company doesn't recognize that they were women, but. I'm, I said that, not you. And no, um, I did not say that. <laughs> no, you did not say that. You know, and I said, I looked in Becky's eyes and there was something about her spirit and her, just how she was. She was like, so like alive and intelligent mm -hmm. and not in the harness. And I said, you are not going to stay here very long. I knew nothing about her. That's true. And that true. right, Becky, so that was a good prediction. Yeah, that is very true. And um, actually, Faith said, you're a bit of a maverick. And and that was true, by the way. And she meant it in a really positive way and not not uh, everyone saw it that way. So I have been, uh, like I said, I've been a Faith follower for, for a long time. Thank you. So Faith, back, back to the trends. I'm curious because, you know, we you talk about planning. Um, how, how are you seeing the trends that you're seeing from the future play out today just in the environment? Like, what are your top three trends that you'd say, this is what we're seeing in the environment? And then I'll do my best job to translate that into what I'm seeing in the world of work. Okay, so, um, you know, we're seeing the clans are getting tighter. The cocoon is getting harder. It used to be like a nice, soft, fuzzy cocoon. The butterfly could maybe, you know, fly in and out. No longer. I think it's become like chrysalis. It's, it's tough. It's hard. And so mm -hmm. clanning, we're hanging around with our pod. And that clan is getting tighter. Our friends mean more to us, but it's smaller. So, I mean, I think that's a big one. Um, mm -hmm. I think vigilante consumer, we're seeing anger, anger in the culture, anger internally. How did we get here? Why did we, you know, why has this been bestowed upon us? Um, we see that, you know, with the country divided and everything, we realize the person you can stand next to might really hate everything you think and everything you think about. So I think, again, we want to hang out with, uh, you know, with people more like us, PLU, people like us. Not, you know, I know that HR is talking, what, inclusive and, you know, we're all in this together. I don't think we feel like we're all in this together. I think we feel like we're in this kind of alone with a few friends. So I think that's what we're, we're seeing, you know, and, and uh, on the other hand of that, I, I think the flip side, and there's always a flip side, I, I refer to dark revelry. There's this trend, we have been in a trend bank a long time called pleasure revenge. I'm opening that bottle of wine that I've been sitting on for how long? I'm just, oh, it feels like, oh, uh, you know? I'm eating an ice cream cone. I don't care. I'm just like my sweatpants go from like a medium to a large. It makes no difference. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like an expression of that. And um, and we don't want a boss. That's mm -hmm. 
and there's Thank become you. equal equality on these zooms because you know you're in, you're with the top layer and the bottom layer all together on one screen and we're, we're beating up the hierarchy and we don't want to be told what to do and we just develop our you know zoom smile and then mm-hmm. proceed to do whatever the hell we want to do and wear whatever the hell we want to wear so very interesting um, so the concept of, of Zoom, someone told me once that the that Zoom or, or any video um, connection is a great equalizer because all of our boxes are the same size. And yes. I thought that was very insightful. Yeah. Michael, I'd love to bring you into this conversation. What are you seeing in terms of consumer trends and how you might see that playing out in your own workforce? Well, I mean, as I mentioned, the home has been redefined by COVID. Um, it's it's where our kids are learning. It's where we're working. It's where we're doing our doctor appointments. It's where we're exercising. Um, it's become more than just a place where we had entertainment, uh, food, and sleep. And it's becoming, as Faith talks about the cocoon, It's it, and it's being hardened. It is because it's the folks that you have in your home. And very seldom do those members change because of COVID, right? So, you know, I see technology in our world, in in this industry, playing such a vital role in enabling the home to have those changes, to enable the interactions necessary for us to do our jobs, for our kids to learn, for our teachers to have access to the kids, right? Um, For the doctors and the patients to have a meaningful conversation around being healthy. And then you start to think about digital wellness and, and what can the home become? Does it, does it make us contemplate the roadway towards a responsive home? Meaning we all have devices in our home that tell us the temperature or we can tell to turn off the light. So, you know, smart IOT devices. But at some point those devices will become responsive. They will tell us you need more oxygen in the living room those lights are really hurting your eyes and they will automatically dim because you've been on the computer for too long. And it'll do those kinds of things that enable, you know, more well-being, not just for your, your body, but for your spirit, for your emotional well-being. And, and I think all of that translates into healthier employees, happier employees, um, particularly those employees who are enjoying working from home. Right. There's there's a, there's certainly a percentage that are ready to go back in, but there's also a larger mostly percentage. Mostly men, of, Michael. Mostly men. Okay. Yeah. Mostly men. It's true. That's a good point, Faith. And and surprisingly, though, you know, just on you know some internal polling, we have found that it is a little bit more diverse than just men. I think demographic, you know, age has something to play into that, um, but. It's interesting that when we look at, and this is interesting wide, um, at employees who are ready to go back versus ready to stay, there's a lot more ready to stay than we've ever expected to see. And, and I think that has to do with technology enabling the experiences necessary to run their lives from their home. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, it will continue to be that way in, at some percentage uh, for, you know, for, the, for the next, I don't think it goes away, frankly. I think you're right. Michael's always right. Michael's the best futurist in the world. I mean, I love him. He's always right. I've tracked him. Quite a compliment from the Trend Oracle, Michael. I've tracked tracked him. He's always right. I put it like you say, a little pin and everything. I don't wonder if he's right about that. Whoops, he was right. So (laughs) my business. This this concept of technology. I'm sorry, Michael. (laughs) I said, faith is being very generous. No, no. <laughs> Here's that business crutch showing up. Yeah, um, this, yeah. this concept, Michael, of technology allowing us, I was taking some notes, to run their lives from their home. Um, I think that's so fascinating because I know for myself, after a day full of, of video meetings, you know, like on my car, think about on your car when you've been driving too long, you'll get an alert that says it's time for a break. I don't get that on my computer. I don't get that from my lighting in my house or my environment, but I, I've never thought about that until you just said it. And it totally could enable 
you know, employees, I won't say, I won't say workers, um, contributors to the economy, Faith, how about that? Contributors to the economy to be more productive and to be, you know, to your point, Michael, to have more wellness. I think that's, um, that's a really fascinating, fascinating thought. And, I, and you're right, I think technology and particularly in your area is gonna enable that. Um, so, uh, so I, go ahead, Michael. No, I was just gonna say, Becky, what's, what's interesting and, and, you know, those in the audience who are curious about this should look to Europe because they're doing a lot of great work around where we are very focused on LEEDS certified buildings, they have a new certification that is all about enabling the wellness of the people occupying that building, primarily office workers, so our employees. And it's a, so it's a new level of certification that does some of the things I just described them a lot more. But I think that we're certainly moving towards that is, is understanding the value, and, and you guys know this, at manpower probably better than anybody the value of a healthy happy employee yes right? yes yeah. yes in fact michael we just did some analysis on um what makes a workplace more attractive than others and traditionally there were things like you know distance to transportation um pay increasingly right. now we are seeing exactly to your point environment environment and that definition of environment really changing to not just um, be safety, but health and and how I feel. You know, I, I was on the record saying we're in the feeling economy because how people feel at work um, is now critical. Um, whereas before it was just, you know, do the job we've given you and you get paid and you're happy with that as a, or satisfied with that as an employee. But the bar for satisfaction has definitely been, has been raised. Um, Faith, I wanna, you, you didn't know we were gonna talk about this, but I know you'll be ready for it. Um, one of my favorite trends that you have had, I think, for, for years now is evolution. Um, can you speak a bit about, for the audience, explain what evolution is, and if you have a perspective on how you think that's showing up um, in the economy in terms of, of employees? So evolution is, the actual definition is, it, I wrote a book called Eve, like Eve, like Adam and Eve, evolution, uh, the eight truths of marketing actually to women, but it's really to women, to blacks, just not to, excuse me, Michael, not to white you know, men, you know, I'll say 45 plus in Michael's case, he's so young. Anyway, um, uh, evolution is about, you know, is about that, about how we spread the word, about what's important to us, about, um, and, and actually I think that, that business cultures are evolving a little bit, you know, toward that. So, um, yeah, that's what it's about. So I think that we're learning that if you don't have a diverse culture, if you don't have enough you know, um, uh, black people, I say black on purpose because not everybody is Afro-American, some are not American, and then mix, mixy, which is my favorite, and then Hispanic, and like being white is about the most boring thing you can be. And people that, you know, like make white cultures, I think that they're missing all the music of the culture. So um, that's what evolution is really about. The music of the culture, I love that language, Faith, that's very Faith popcorn language. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I, so I want to I just pivot off that just a little bit, because one of the things that I'm seeing in the world of, of work is women are dropping out of the workforce right now at you know, one of the fastest paces that we've seen, particularly um, millennial aged women. And as we've done research, it's exactly what, Michael, you were talking about. Like I'm, I'm teacher, I'm, like I've got a kid right now upstairs on, on Zoom, you know, hoping that we're not going to, to uh, tax the broadband, Michael. Um, I do have Comcast for the record, so that, but it, it's, you. it's, um, you know, it's, it's, I have so many responsibilities now in addition to work. And so I'm curious, you know, Faith and Michael in your, in your environments and the people that you work with, what are you seeing around the role that women are playing and how this a crisis is impacting them? And Michael, we'll start with you and then Faith, I'll come back to you to wrap us up. Yeah. Yeah, so if you don't mind, I want to back up just a little bit and kind of pivot on what Faith just mentioned about diversity, because, you know, we talk about all these changes that we're experiencing as a culture, you know, and, and, and how it's impacting workers and friends, family, et cetera. And we're all referring to it as the COVID impact and not really giving enough um, enough attention to the social unrest caused by you know, the murder of George Floyd. And I think the two combined have really brought us to this place that we have to pay very close attention to because they're not, while they are separate and apart, the combination is somewhat of the impact we're experiencing today. And so 
I think that as we, I, you know, as we talk about all of these changes, we do have to recognize that impact. Um, and, I, and, and now, Becky, I can't remember what your question was. I apologize. It was more, I was pivoting off of diversity and inclusion and the impact that the um, crisis has had on women, specifically dropping out of the workforce. And I'm just curious what you're seeing in your businesses, whether it be about women or other you know, impacted groups and their reaction to the crisis. Well, I, I think that um, companies who are paying incredibly close attention to the communities that are most impacted by what we're talking about today, uh, be it the social un unrest and communities of color, or um, single parents, women, uh, you know, single moms particularly, uh, but also, you know, moms who are, you know, executive moms who have, a, you know, a spouse in the home. We, we have to recognize that while we try to make accommodations to make sure that Okay, you have all the office essentials. You have a comfortable chair. You know, we've told you you can be flexible in your work hours and those kinds of things. What we have to be very, very aware of is that there are very individual experiences happening in the homes today of our employees. So while I may have an, an employee with three kids, two of them may be infants. That's a very different experience than if those three kids are all high school age. Or, or college age. If if I have a parent at home who's a single dad uh, that's living here, wherever here is, completely isolated from family members, then that's a very different experience than if his parents live right down the street and are able to participate in helping with the child. If I have this, you know, the, a, a mother who is the um, uh, the head of household. Um, you know, what impact is that to her from a flexible hour perspective, right? And so while, while we try as companies to provide the package of technology and experiences at the home necessary for the employees to feel most comfortable and contributory, there, we also have to be very, very clear that there are experiences happening in each individual home that we just have to be sensitive to because we can't cure for those as well. So Michael, you just made me think about something I've never been able to art articulate. So I'm gonna credit you with this from this point forward. Um, there are individual experiences happening during work. Now it happens to be at home during work versus when we're going to the workplace, there were collective experiences happening at work. And so I think mm -hmm. this juxtaposition of the individual experience was was kind of tucked away and kept at home. And now it is brought to the center because home and work are, are one. And I think that's um, very insightful. And I think there's been gifts in that too, by the way. I've seen you know my yeah. team's kids, I've seen their parents, I've seen lots of pets. Um, and it, it's, it, there's gifts in that because I feel like I, I know them better. Um, Faith, just curious, have you, have you heard from your clients or do you have observations on this as well? Like the impact of you know, whether it be women or, or um, single parents and this impact of the crisis on home and work. Yeah, you know, I was going to say, like, uh, one of uh, Michael's uh, compatriots, I think he's CMO now, John Allard, was saying, he, he gave me, I read that to you, Michael, he gave me the best quote. He said, he felt our contribution was, but also what COVID has done is compressed the future, shoved it right into the present. So while women were at work and feeling like nobody gives a you know really damn about me and nobody really they're 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 playing paying lip service to I have to pick the kids up from the nursery but they're saying that I'm a wussy worker really if I have to do that um, I think that that's coming to the fore and if you want to know why women aren't I mean I'm not going to give the whole why that would take like 500 hours but not wanting to enter back into the workplace is because they don't feel welcome in the workplace. And just to say, I mean, I don't want to, you know, Betsy, Becky, I mean, you told me I could bring this up, but, you know, like, you know, manpower, really? I can't believe you've been there and not been able to change that name. Why is so Faith, it? I was, I was ready for you to bring that up. So this is a passion point for Faith. So now yeah. I, I get to hear what the audience on. Oh, manpower. Where the name came from. And so, you know, you're a student of brands. So where Manpower Group came from is we were actually formed after World War II when the men came home and women all lost their jobs. And so our founder 
had the foresight to say women can contribute to the manpower that fuels the economy just like men can. And so that's that's where the name started. I mean, and so there's actually a really empowering story behind it. All yeah. right, but you can't have a paragraph to explain your name, you know? <laughs> That bugs me. Another thing that bugs me, I mean, an endless list, but, you know, MasterCard. Like, what the hell is that? Do MasterCard. I feel welcome into MasterCard? Like, you know, that in, in, in real estate, they've changed the name of the master bedroom for that reason. Mm -hmm. They call it oh. the, the larger suite or whatever the hell they call it, but they don't call it MasterCard. So between Manpower and MasterCard, I want to stay home. You know, and women mm -hmm. have always started businesses at twice the, you know, their own small businesses at twice the rate of men. But I don't want to deal. I mean, if I can, it's a luxury. It's an upscale luxury to be able to say this because most women have to go to work. And a mm -hmm. lot of the women, they're like farm workers, they're waitresses, they're working kitchens, they're cleaning, they're doing all. They're not executives, most of them. So they don't get to say, oh, I don't think, you know, I don't feel welcome you know, in the, in, in, in the cafeteria, so I'm not going to go to work. But those of us who have a choice, I think, are saying, mm, I don't have to, uh, I don't feel good about it. I want to open my own thing. Uh, I don't feel recognized. I don't feel included. And uh, I think that's why you're losing them. And also, we put too much pressure on them. Yes, yes, I do. I do think there's you know, the, the crisis has had had gifts and I think pressure to your point. Um, Faith, I want to go back to planning and actually something, Michael, you said as well, but we'll start with you, Faith. So we, we are seeing, you know, employers group people by age groups or gender. So millennials don't want to go back to work. Gen Z does because it's their community and it's how they learn. Um, should, should businesses, Faith, be thinking about, you know, um, employees and demographics or you think there's a better way to think about clans? Well, soon we're not going to have to think about it at all as we become robots. So, I mean, there's an evolution into, you know, true. I mean, if you get a lot of these big companies behind closed doors, they will tell you that they're replacing humans with robots as fast as they possibly can. They don't complain. They don't need benefits. They don't go to lunch. They don't want a vacation. It's cold. They don't need lights to work. I mean, think of that, the energy you save. But, um, you know, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't. Michael, what do you think? Um, you know, when we think about, I, I think it's always short-sighted to just group people by demographics, because I do think that, um, you know, while if you're 25, the majority of the way you act or think might represent your generation, but it's not 100% of you. You know, the rest of you is because of the way you grew up. It's because of your gender, it's because of your sexual identity, it's because of your race, it's because it's because it's because. And you so you, you know, that it, while I understand the, the need and the necessity of sort of breaking the, you know, everybody into these categories of generations, I think that the best consumer brands who can break through to multiple generations are those who recognize those nuances and who appreciate those nuances. And again, while you may have to, in some ways, mass market towards uh, a certain segment, um, there are other ways to recognize those nuances in your approach and appeal. So it sounds like, Michael, you're saying a hybrid view. You know, you might have to do some aggregation, but truly you can't assume that, that a demographic profile means 100%. I, that's that's how I feel. I really yeah. I really believe. That. It's also dangerous, you know. If, if research worked, if that kind of research worked, if any kind of research worked, you would never make a mistake in launching a product. Everything you would come out would be a hundred percent successful. The right. fact is that research you're calling it nuances, and that's true. But it's not just nuances. People miss big big insights by doing research. So um, I believe in not ethnographies, again, that's a very like tiny little like limited way of thinking about things. But if people would just kick themselves out of their offices and go meet some people and go observe some things, mm. you know, we predicted vigilante consumer like 25 years ago. I mean, the, people, the fact that the people are in the streets now, that they will continue to be in the streets, that they are really pissed off and angry, 
that they're making their voices heard, you know, um, it's, it's not going to be buried anymore. Uh, maybe right. the, the confinement of COVID maybe has made the thing even more explosive. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, that we are seeing um, even again, even in the, the employee side of things, we're seeing the rise of the employee voice that they yeah. want to have a voice in the environment they're working in, wh when they're working, where they're working. Um, and that that's new. And we we knew probably 18 months ago, so not, not 25 years ago, Faith, we're not quite as futuristic as you are, uh, but we knew a while ago that people wanted to have more flexibility. They wanted one life. We knew that. And COVID has accelerated and made that possible. And I think in your opening, um, Faith, you said people have gotten a taste of it now. And I, I agree, there are, there are groups of people who want to be in the office, some, um, there are very few who want to be in the office all. And we do see some differences across generations. And I, I do agree with you, Michael, you can't say 100%, but the, the, the part that we all have to be cognizant of is, you know, boomers and Gen X are leading our, co our companies today. And they're the ones who most want to go back because we were raised with a separation of work and life. But the millennials and the Gen Zs you know, they want this flexibility and, and speaking as a Gen X or so do I. And so I think you can't, you know, you can't make assumptions, but the, it, it does though raise a question, Faith, I'd love your view on um, how do you build culture then? So if culture was built traditionally in the office, and I know you've been on the record saying the office, office life is on the verge of extinction, how will we build culture in the futures if we're not having, you know, ping pong, ping pong tables and uh, water coolers? Uh culture. So um, I don't know if you have the nerve to say about building uh, corporate culture. Corporate, ha corporate has to earn the right to create culture. It has to, and you know, they're really pissed off about this. Let me tell you. I mean, we deal with like, you know, mainly like, you know, all these like chairman and they, so again, I'm sorry to say this white men over 50, they are so um, I don't know what they're so amazed about, but they're so amazed. Oh my God, nobody's listening to me anymore. And like, it, you know, it doesn't matter. And I have to serve them now. And what is that about? And they're going to leave very soon, of course. But um, you, you're going to have to build a culture outside of the office that includes office instead mm -hmm. of building a culture inside the office that circles maybe home and other life. Um, what what office deserves to have a culture? Mainly, the office culture is gossip culture, which is a lot of fun. I admit, you know, talking about each other in the worst possible ways. So that is fun. But you know, and 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 I, you know, these guys, the, the heads of companies, they write these statements about what their company is. I mean, that is really go to sleep stuff. I mean, who half the employees haven't read it, and. Uh, it, it's just not the way to speak to people. The people have to, you know, write what they want when they go to work. You know, the I idea that we don't have child care in most of our com ingenuity after how many years of work, you know, my one of, you know, a, a good client, uh, you know, and you knew her too, Becky, she tried, mm -hmm. but she didn't bring child care until she was there. How many years? 20 years? 20 yeah. years oh yes now we're going to have something approach. there's no excuse for that you have yeah, to include think, my culture as a worker i don't have I, to buy into your culture i think it's so interesting faith your comment on um, culture outside the office it includes office so michael I'll, I'll come to you i'd love to hear your take on that because again you're in the middle of it running your own business um, particularly around innovation, which traditionally requires a lot of interaction and collaboration. Like, what are your thoughts on how we'll build culture um, when we don't have a place to come together to build culture, physical place to come together to build culture? Um, you know, one of the things that I think I learned from uh, the Gen Xers particularly, and, and the millennials uh, solidified it, was that it's not what you wrote in a book that tells me the culture of your company. It's today more than ever, what do you stand for as a company? What is it that you invest in as a company? What do you, what do you, what positions do you take? I don't think it's any longer acceptable for companies to say, we're not going to talk publicly about that because, you know, we just, we're going to have to stay silent on that one. 
companies are going to have to make decisions on we're going to stand up for what our employees believe in. And that's, I think, when you get back to the demographics, you can look at your employee base and see who's in what age groups and generally understand what's most important to those age groups and understand the overlays of your employees of color, your, you know, the race and gender, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, you know, everyone's paying attention to what does that company stand for? And if it stands for nothing, then it, it does evolve. It devolves into what Faith was saying, you know, that office of, you know, where you just go to gossip, right? That, that's no longer, that's, that's just no longer of interest to employees of the future. They want to go to work for companies that stand for what they stand for, period. Yeah, I agree. The ethics of the company must have an equal sign to my ethics. And I don't think companies are there yet, not by a long shot. And why aren't they there? Because they don't think they have to. People do things when they, especially corporations, only when they really have to. And usually that's too late. But that's why this is going to be a very, and back to your brilliant question, Becky. As always, why are you losing women? Because everything we're talking about here, does that feel like women? No, you know? I love, I love faith ethics equal my ethics. I think, and I think Michael, you, I mean, we, we, again, this is something that, that we saw, and this is probably going back a few years now, but this rise of purpose and that I want to associate yeah. with work. So again, remember you, you all are, are in the product space. So in products, of course, I want to support a product or a brand I, I believe in. We've now seen that translated into employers. I want to work for an employer, not just for pay, but for purpose. Right. And that, that right. is a translation. That's a good, that's a good that. saying. That could be yeah. man power saying or woman power saying, not just for pay, but yeah. for, purpose. for purpose. That's beautiful. Yes, yes. So, so Michael, you talked about the connected home and um, the reactive, mm -hmm. you know, uh, proactive, I think is, was actually your word, home. I'm curious, with this rise of technology and communication, do you see that getting to a point where people will become overstimulated? Like, do you see a correction that they'll, they'll switch off and want to disconnect? What is your outlook on that? Yeah, well, I mean, a couple of things. One is the responsive home will enable you to disconnect because it's going to tell you it's time to disconnect. It'll tell you you've had enough stimulation for the day. Your kid's been on way too long. Uh, you know, your spouse is, uh, you know, exhausted, I can tell, by the speed of their responses and these kinds of things. Um, and, and I think that while we say, while so many consumers say that we don't want a big brother watching over our shoulder, I think consumers are ready for us also to, to, in, to at least... Uh, entertain the prospect of saying, if the technology can do these things for me, I'm willing to give up some information. I'm willing to share that data with you, Mr. Technology Company, if you uh, make my life easier, if you personalize my experiences, if you customize my needs and wants according to what I say they are, I'll share that data with you. And better yet, I might even sell that data to you. Because really, I think consumers more than ever before are understanding data is power, and it really is an asset. And actually, Faith lifted some of that up for us as well, and some of the work she did with us was, you know, data is an asset. And, and the more I dig into it, the more uh, I 100% agree with that statement. So. If you remember back, not that long ago, just a few years ago, when parents were very, very concerned about gaming and kids were always doing this and they were gaming, 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 and it was like, they're not gonna, you know, it's taken away from socialization. It's not enabling uh, collaboration. How are they gonna learn to get along with other people if all they're doing is locked up in their room doing? Well, what we found out is that they're creating these deep relationships with other gamers. They're collaborating on teams, gaming. They're learning the power of, I do this better than you do that. So you do that better than I do this. Let's collaborate and form the team to win. So I think that technology does a, a swing. You know, there's always a yin and a yang to it. And gaming is, I think, a perfect example of, of how we've learned that 
while yes, it can be uh, somewhat, you know, it can put people in an isolation experience, it can do exactly the opposite too. I, I agree with him. If you want to create an office culture, create the office in the game. You know, I think everything's going to happen in the game, actually. So, and, um, you know, the and, 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 and the fine line between human and game, human and avatar, we're seeing like, you know, uh, like stars dropped into like, uh, you know, uh, Fortnite and concerts and Fortnite. Put it in the game, you've got it. So, hmm. uh, yeah. Every, Faith, you're right. Everything, every experience we have in the future will be gamified to an extent. Yes. You know, yeah. the way we enter. So think about the day of the future where you can actually, and, and today you can, there are some platforms that enable bits and pieces of this, but you can write the ending to the story. You can change the actors. You can mm -hmm. act with it. All this self-generated user content is, is, just, is just the beginning. I mean, everything will have a gamification aspect to it. Learning, think about today, you know, Fisher Price has almost everything that teaches your toddler, you know, hit a button this way, hit a button that way, and it's all gamified. But when you put the buttons together, it equals something, right? Yeah. They, they kid, toddlers have been doing this for you know, since they were toddlers. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, hmm. So go ahead, people are lazy. You know, we in 1980 we said every everything would be delivered home, and oh no, women love to go to the supermarkets. That's where they socialize. These. <laughs> A CPG company said that in their words in English to us. Yeah. And we, you know, so we said, so, so they're lazy. So that's why Michael's saying they're going to sell their information. Give me everything. I don't care. Then, you know, I'll just like just sit here and just take everything. If you want to get really scared because you're not scared enough, um, watch Social Dilemma. On, oh, I'll right? say that. I've seen it. I recommended broadly to my team to watch it. It is, um, it is terrifying. It, it, it is, I'd say it's terrifying and super insightful. Like I learned so much that I didn't know um, from watching it. Uh, so I, I want to go back to something, Faith, and you and I will remember this. And, and Michael, we didn't know each other at this time, but we used to talk about this big trend. This is now we're going back a decade, maybe further, Faith, around consumer and control. And so I'm curious, you know, this concept of we're seeing it now. I'm seeing it in the workplace. And so I, I around, I want to be in control. And so this, this idea of writing the end of the story, like self authoring the end of the story, um, are you seeing that? Like, that's just the way things are now. Um, Cause I definitely am seeing that rise in the way we think about our, our um, employment. Yeah. Consumer and control back to, uh, what workers rise or wherever we yeah. are, you know, I mean, it is the workers revolution consumer yes. worker. And I'm also, that's another word we could talk about another time, but like consumer, is that what we are? Big, ugly eating things. But, you know, the, you know, the workers are in control. It w they won't come to work and you need them to come to work. If you don't yeah. give them a, you know, a place that they, not only a beautiful place, but a place that is dictated by what they want. And now what are you going to do? Because look at the division even in the country. What about in an office place? If you know, if you notice, like if you go to a party, what do you see? The women are in one corner, the men are in the other. The black people are talking to each other, the Hispanics are talking to each other. I mean, there's such like, so when you say in control, who? Who are you talking to? So do you mm -hmm. have to have like 25 control, like on that, you know, gaming things of buttons, you know, 25 controlling modules? This is going to be not just intuitive, but the reason I brought up social dilemma is because more and more it's going to be controlled from an app. It's going to be app adjusted, app mm -hmm. controlled. And the thing about social dilemma is that our biases are strung into those apps. So the apps are going to be, if you have an app, and I know in your business there are apps, you know, for getting jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, discrimination is wired into those apps mm -hmm. very subtly. So um, it just gets more and more, more and more where at the end of the day you really need a drink. Alcoholic <laughs> beverages... <laughs> And I don't wait till the end of the day. Okay. Beverages are rising like crazy. We have a client constellation brands. Oh my God. And then, you know, they bought uh canopy growth. You know, we did some work with them, but mood modulation, you know, yeah. that's it. Yes. Mood modulation. I wasn't prepared for alcoholic beverages, Faith, just so you know. 
Um, so I want to move. We've gotten several questions. I want to move to some questions, oh, uh, and we'll come, we'll come back. Um, so, Michael, the first question, I'll start with you, and then, Faith, I'll come to you. Sure. How should people lead in a disruptive time? Are we ready for a more mindful way of being and doing business? So it's more of a leadership question, Michael. Yeah, you, um, it's a great question, and it's on everybody's mind today. And I, I, I think we're, we're, we're. I, I think there's an evolution of it. So, so here's what I would say from my experience. Um, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about individual employee experiences within their four walls that we don't have insight to, and and you've got to as a leader leave mm -hmm. room for that. Um, not only in what you say, but in what you don't say. Not only in what you ask, but what you don't ask. There are times where you need to leave the employees some room for them to just have to deal with what they're dealing with. And if if they say, look, I, can I get it back to you later this afternoon versus 10 o'clock this morning? You know, there has to be room for you to be able to say, do I really need it at 10 or can, will this afternoon be okay? And those mm. little bits of empathy that they are they they mean so much to the employees today because the employees are recognizing these subtle leadership positionings that are occurring. It's so so you know, I know that people said well, we have to have meetings with our teams every week to stay in touch. Mm. Well, a meeting just to stay in touch is just a meeting that's interrupting my day. If you want to stay in touch, think about ways that are meaningful to your employees. And sometimes it's as, it's as simple as, you know, we've done things like virtual escape rooms, uh -huh. right? So you, uh -huh. and a lot of fun, you know, everybody can get engaged. It's, it's mindful, it's active, it's, uh, and it's teamwork. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're doing book clubs and all these kinds of things. But my point is, is that, as a leader, you have to be aware of what you're asking your teams to do by saying, we're gonna stay in touch every week. In touch just to say we're staying in touch or in touch because you really care. Demonstrate that you either want us to have fun or that you're, you know, you're, being, you're giving us an opportunity to be provocative about conversation, uh, a safe space to have the, you know, a dialogue around you know, the things that are happening in and around our companies and our world right now, our communities. I mean, what is it that you're staying in touch about? I think you just have to ask yourself that question constantly. Yeah, so Faith, I want to come to you on that question, but I just want to put a pin in something you said, Michael. That, I mean, you you know, you said a meeting is just interrupting my day. So it, it's an interesting way to think about it. Like what's the, and you know, we all go back to what's the purpose of the meeting. But if we say we want to stay in touch and meeting the way, the way to do that, I think is what you're, you're posing a perspective that says not always. Um, so I think that's interesting. Right. So Faith, your builds on how should people lead during this time? Like what are, what are people looking for from their leaders? I love what Michael's saying. He's talking about an authority diminishment. You know, usually we get like a thrill when we're authority. You better get this thing here at 10 o'clock. And if you're late, I'm putting, you know, it's showing me X, Y, Z about your commitment to this kind of all this really crap. And I'll tell you, I was one of those people. I mean, I was like, uh, you know, I'm so like over organized. It's ridiculous. And mm. now, you're right. You just say like, do I need it? Do I care? Does it matter? Everything that took a day now takes a week. So if they're late and their kids, you know, run by and, you know, so what? So, um, yes. Yeah. You know, and the, the other word, um, that, that I heard is empathy. You know, one of the things mm -hmm. I've found is we're not, you don't get to ignore the home now. No, it's part right. of, it's part of what we all get to see of each other. I mean, I, I know faith I'm seeing part of your home, Michael, I think we're seeing part of your home. You're seeing part of my home. You know, i said, I have a daughter upstairs. My dogs are outside the door. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a fragile ecosystem of silence right now in my house. So it's, yeah, uh, but I, you don't get That's to ignore nice. that. Nice language. Yeah. We're, we're seeing a lot of each other's homes, the humanness. And I yes. think we yes. try to do the humanity and I, well, Michael's always been an empathetic leader, but there are, or just an empathetic human. Maybe you should call it human power instead of manpower. Anyway, um, I'll be working on that the rest of the week. Um, so <laughs> uh, going down that rabbit hole that nobody, needs, but, you know, I, I think empathy. Yeah. Women have always been empathetic. And what did, what did men call it? Like, you know, when they walk in the room and the women are chatting, they go like, they think they're gossiping or, you know, but really they're saying, and they really mean it. 
how's your husband? How was the day? Did you get divorced? What happened? Did the kid like get on its uh, medication, or you know, is it still have? Does she or he still have ADHD? Or whatever. I think knowing more about, to your point, Becky, about what's going on in that home. I'm taking the dog to the vet. Okay, but you know, in the next day, you got like, what happened? How did you know turn out? Yeah. Um, we're learning what kind of partners people have, yes. what color they are, what sex they are. You know, really, I I kind of I kind of like that. Um, so yeah, we're getting more personal. Yes. You know how you say it's not a business thing to be too personal. Oh, that's too personal a question. You know, so I think all our questions are personal. So I think. Empathy, if it's sincere, yeah. is, is a beautiful thing. And maybe that's the new culture. An yes. empathetic, loving, I know those don't go with business, it's an oxymoron, but um, loving, empathetic culture. That's, yes. by the way, that's evolution. That's a female culture, a female led in its ethic culture. Yes, yes. I do, I do think we're seeing um, the, the word business is being redefined, it is personal. Yes. It is acceptable to ask about family. In fact, it's desired. And on the other side, too, Faith, you said, yes, you know, not, that's not business. Employees would have been like, why is she asking me that? You know, why would you want to know that? But now it, it truly is this whole life. Like everybody's bringing their whole life and you can't avoid it because we can all see it. So it, yeah. I think it's um, the intimacy of work is at a level I've personally never seen before. It's, you know, work is intimate now. And I think that unlocks creativity. It unlocks voice. It welcomes people to the table. Um, I believe that's one of the gifts of the crisis is the intimacy of work. I'm, I'm personally very excited about that. So, um, well Michael, said. a question. Oh, sorry, Michael, you were going to say something? No, I just said well said. Yeah, I no. agree. Well said. It's the intimacy of work. As you would yes. say, you could stick a pin in that. Don't stick a pin yes. in that. Frame it. <laughs> I'll stick a pin in that. Uh, so, Michael, a question came in about the, it, a lot of folks are intrigued by this responsive home. Uh, and so it's, a, it's a, a little bit of a controversial question. So if we have a more responsive home, could that deepen the divide between the haves and have nots? Oh, wow. That is, you know what, that is on the mind of anyone or it should be on the mind of anyone who produces any kind of product. Um, Certainly, as you see, you know when the when electric cars first came out, right? They, they were they were at a price point where there were just certain people that could afford them. But now, you know, you can buy a, a low price point, you know, electric car, right? So I think when when product first comes out, it's naturally expensive because it's the first. That said, there is a huge focus on everything from including these type technologies when a home is built to working with the government on retrofitting Fannie Mae homes that have been repossessed. Mm -hmm. So That's I mean, it goes, it goes from one end to the other because guess what? It, it, it works for everybody. It's good for the consumer. It's good for the business provider. It's good for everybody from insurance companies who can actually use these sensors to understand proactively what's happening in the home. If there's, if, is, is your home going to flood because of the age of your water heater? We should, you should have that looked at before it actually floods. If mm -hmm. you have that sensor, many insurance companies today offer an advanced discount because of it. So it's, it's, there are ways to democratize it, so to speak. Um, but there are certain things, just like when HD TVs first came out or 4K TVs, they're very expensive, and then you see the prices come down. But it's it's absolutely critical that companies who are producing product contemplate and consider that. You know, yes. it's a Tom, Tom's model. Tom was so brilliant. You know, the Tom shoe guy. Yes. You know, two for. I know it reduces profitability, but I mean, you almost have to say if you're going to make one thing for a rich person, you've got to give one thing to a person that doesn't have as much money. And um, I know they're going to be very slow to go, but they're going to be less slow to go when they have to be boarding up their windows and boarding up their companies because people are, you know, getting angry. And un when un uneducated people get angry, it's even more dangerous. Yeah. Well, it's the whole concept of purpose coming back central. Um, okay, so I have my last rapid fire question for us, and then I will close us. So um, I'd love you both to answer one final question to leave us with some parting wisdom. 
what which pandemic trend or pandemic impact that you've seen do you think is here to stay and what's one thing you think will go away if you believe there is so what's here to stay and it's one thing you think will go away and faith will start with you and michael will give you the final word um i think the thing that will stay is we will not be going back to work i think that's going to stick and the sooner that businesses wrap their minds around that you know, the the better they'll be. I think there's still a lot of resistance. And I know a lot of companies are forcing their people to go back to work, you know, by making them feel really bad about not going back to work. But then on the other hand, they think, oh, I'll get sued if they come back to work and they get sick, you know, so they're letting them stay home. They're very, like, psycho about this. But I, I think people will not really want to go back to work. They've so enjoyed not commuting. They've so enjoyed not having people that they don't like pop into their office. They so enjoyed, you know, not having to show up at a ridiculous hour. I think that, th that they're not going to want to go back. Thank you, Faith. And Michael, what is your view? You know, I think uh, telemedicine uh, is here to stay, but in a very, very big way. I think it's going to solve for just everything from just the, you know, simplistic view of inconvenience to the very complex view of providing um, medical services and digital wellness to rural communities who don't have access to it today. So I think that's here to stay. I think what we're going to see go away are uh, the fear of travel, uh, the fear of dot, dot, dot. I do think that, you know, we're going to get smarter about the way we protect ourselves. Hopefully we'll have, you know, vaccines that actually work. Um, and when and when we start to see the full on scale of distribution, et cetera, it, it's going to bring back that feeling of, OK, I can trust now. I can trust again and we're going to participate. Hotel industry is going to come back. Airline industry, trains, et cetera, mass transit will start to see coming back. I agree. And it's the end of the doctor. I mean, telemedicine brings us the end of the doctor. Elon Musk was talking about putting a neural link in people's brains so it could correct, you know, all kinds of things internally and also know what you're thinking. But you know who puts that neural link in your brain? It's a robot. It's not a doctor. And telemedicine is a lot of it robotic and analyzing, you know, from a robotic point of view. Um, so it's taking the human away from doctors. So, yeah, I agree with you, Michael. Telemedicine, it's it. Faith, we often oh, say. And, and I just want to say, and telesex. Oh. That's going to be an enormous. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay, between that and mood mod modulation. Um, so I want to bring both your ideas together because we often say work has left the building. So Faith, your idea, people don't want to come back to work, work has left the building. It, it appears, Michael, that doctors have left the building as well. Like you don't have to go to the yeah. building thing now. You know, it's the, it's the return of the house call in a whole different um, cost structure. So I just wanna, I wanna do a quick recap of in closing some of the things that I thought were just so impactful from today. Um, first, you know, bringing the future forward faster, like that's what the crisis has done. That was some beautiful language um, early in our discussion. This concept of individual experiences are happening during work versus collective experiences happening at work. And so how you bring this intimacy of work into, um, well, you know, it's not how you bring it, it's that it's here. The intimacy of work yeah. is, is here and work and home are, are truly one. Um, this culture, Faith, you mentioned the culture outside the office that includes the office versus the office culture. It's really the 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 culture that includes the office versus the office culture. Um, we, we talked about not just pay. Um, you're not just working for pay, but you're working for purpose and, and how purpose is becoming so much more important in the consumer world as well as in the consumer equal employee world. Um, consumer and control, self-generated user content. We had a robust discussion around that. And then we closed with work has left the building and, and doctors are now doing house calls in a whole new way. And so I, I just am so grateful to both of you. Faith, it's a delight for me to see you again. Michael, what a privilege it is to spend time with you. Um, thank you for bringing this consumerism of, of talent, the consumerism of the employee into our conversation today. Um, it, has been, it has been fun. It has been enlightening. And I'm grateful to both of you. And for all of our audience, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Thank you well, everybody. Thanks.